How do you pronounce your last name? Just so I don't screw it up. I just say Frunzi in English. So you pronounce the Romanian e? dude sound like uh in Romanian dude sound like Frunze. Oh, it's a short e, eh. like Frunze. But yes, that's exactly right. In Romanian. In Romanian, yes. Okay, so you want me to say it in English or Romanian? Very Romanian. It would be funny. Very okay. Romanian. Frunze. Yes. It means leaves. Leaves? Yes. Like the three leaves. That's awesome. You ready? This edition of Strata Originals podcast, you are in for a bit of a treat. We have Christian Frunze. He is in Moldova. He is 18 years old. And he is what I would call, or what I would have called a boy wonder. He's not a boy. Maybe he's a teenager in age, but he's full adult in his intelligence and where he is in his life. So welcome, Christian. Hey, great to be here. I just want to explain a little bit my boy wonder comment. I don't want people to think of you as a boy because you're certainly not, but you did, you do read a lot and you did some pretty incredible things when you were growing up. So why don't you start with telling us how old you were when you read your first book? I started reading at five and I was consistently reading when I was like six and seven years old. Uh, I started with science encyclopedias. And then I switched to uh, fiction, like Harry Potter was my first series of books when I was a second reader. Then I switched to classics. Uh, and I've always been reading for my whole life. How many books would you say you read a month? Right now, it would be about four books per month. I used to read 10 books a month, and my max was 40 books in a single month. 30, 30 that books. That was my record. Yes. 30 books. And what kind of books are they? In the last couple of years, I've been reading, of course, I read a lot of books. Primarily, it would be business books, certain stuff I might need in my businesses. Uh, once upon a, I, I've started reading like self-development books years ago. I've stopped reading those. The information is kind of repetitive once you read a couple of those. So self-development. Is that what you said? Yeah, but, but was, yeah, but self-development books. Uh, I've been reading those three or four years ago. Now it's, I think 60, 70% business books and 40% random stuff. Might be spirituality, might be health, might be who knows what else. And Weird stuff as well. And so you started your first company at 14? Yes, I was 14. And what kind of company was that? When I was 14, uh, the pandemic just, uh, and the lockdown just came. So I did, I saw the rise of online education and I created my free, I, I wasn't set out to create a company, but somehow I created my first company, which was an online course creator, uh, online course creation company where basically we hired instructors who would film programming courses, design courses, marketing courses, and we launched them online and it blew up, of course, uh, because it was specifically focused on the Romanian market where there was a deep lack of online education, there was no one on the market. So we basically had a monopoly because there was no one else. Yeah. And 
And then that turned into full on educational courses. Yeah, that turned to, we now have 15 online courses, full on educational courses created and, by like a team of 20 instructors. And where did you get the money for that? The of funds came from my personal funds. Uh, the way I did it was I created I created an online course myself. Then with those funds, I used those to fund my startup. But that wasn't nearly enough. So the other half of the funds came from my family. And I like came to them with a whole business plan. Uh I created like a pitch deck. Of course I was 14. I didn't know anything, but they gladly uh, told me I could use their funds to invest in my startup. So clearly you must have known something though, because while other kids are playing video games and delivering newspapers and doing whatever else to try and make money, you were starting your own company. Yeah, I was like, I had a whole pitch deck. I had an Excel file with like seven different sheet uh, tabs with graphs, with revenue, with profits. My mom is an accountant, so she knew all those things. Uh, she was quite impressed when she saw all of that. Uh, I really put a lot of effort into that. So I think this is what convinced my parents to lend me those funds. And how many people- It's a huge amount too. Yeah, but still, it's a business plan and you're getting money. So how many people worked for you then? Like, what kind of people were you hiring? They started with uh, hiring seven instructors. They, at the beginning, they were mostly freelancers with a lot of experience. And then we would work together on creating those courses. Of course, not had any online course creation experience because there were, well, no online courses already. So there was a lot of trial and error involved, but also like we needed to hire editors, we needed to hire uh, marketers eventually, whole team like website designers, accountants, like to just manage the business. It was not only instructors. So if there were like 20 instructors, they have across the lifetime of a business, I think there were 70 people who worked with who whom I worked with this on this. And what did it grow to? I mean, I think you your first course was like a graphics design course and then you expanded. Yeah, my first course that was created by me, uh, it got a thousand enrollments in three months. Then the whole business grew to 50,000 students by 2023. Wow. And then what did you do with that business? Is it still around? Yeah, that business is still around all alive and well. It just, I just turned it into a nonprofit last year in 2023. It's focused on my other businesses and to actually make a bigger impact with that. And so what was your reasoning for turning it into a nonprofit? I really believe in education as a primary driver of growth. And I, the mission of a business from when I started was to make education accessible for specifically for Romanians, for people living in Romania and Moldova. And when I reached like roughly the 50,000 students number, of course, there was still a lot of opportunity to grow. With then, uh, to make education to actually make education accessible for everyone. Well, at that point, actually, don't needed didn't really need more funds to create more courses because I already had those. So we had the products created. We just need to reach a larger audience, and the best way to do that is to just offer everything for free. And I decided this would be the best approach instead of just marketing harder which would be the 
like we would have been Vava way around. We could have marked it harder. But then to the same amount of students, we would just rely on organic growth and free marketing, word of mouth marketing, uh, because our courses were free and premium level quality, of course. That's amazing. And I could afford to do that. At yeah. that point, I could afford to do that. Because you'd already started your other business. Yeah, it wasn't my primary income anymore. So what was your, what is your, what was your second business? My second business was a marketing agency for educational brands. So when I found success with Smart Quarries, my first business, I started an agency to help to, in order to expand into international markets, to help education brands abroad to do the same thing in their own countries. So I did that and that became my main business after Smart Quarries. And so what happened with that business? They switched to another opportunity when at that business, I developed an AI technology to help us get more clients. And then I realized why use this for such a limited opportunity. It wasn't really a limited opportunity, but of course more limited. So, so sorry, so, so you were fine. You were helping companies in North America? Primarily the US, yes, yes. and yes. Europe. Um, find students for their online courses. Yes, that okay. was what I was doing. And and incorporating AI. That wasn't the primary focus of a business. Uh, but but it was. I wasn't doing AI at all. Yeah. Right. Okay. I mean, when I started it, there wasn't any AI, so couldn't do that. Okay. So what happened with that business? It went well. It Did went it? very well. Uh, it. It went so well, I couldn't manage things properly. Uh, it grew way too fast. Two times. So one th the first time it grew too fast, one of the platforms we were working with basically told us to stop because we couldn't basically handle the amount of students and thought we, and even thought we were doing something suspicious. Because you were getting so many students onto that Yeah, platform. we were getting, yeah, and we were getting so many students and uh, they thought we were doing something suspicious because no one really uh, got so many students uh, that wasn't a celebrity, of course. And so that was the first time it grew too fast. And the second time was when we developed our own technology based on AI. And then it, it grew too fast. And it went well, that group went well. It's just that I realized this could be used for way bigger things. And that's when I switched the 10X growth mindset. So that's when you switched to can AI, like with yeah. generating leads. That's when I switched to my first startup, which is now a technology startup, which is pretty exciting. Wow, we how businesses generate more leads with personalized email marketing. At, which is your current company called Ken AI. Yes, exactly. So you, you founded Ken AI when you were what age? I was just about to turn 18 when I founded Ken AI. Right. And you're still in high school? Yes, I'm still in high school. And so you do this after school. Yes. I like to phrase it, I do school after this. Okay, I got it. Well, I think the time difference kind of works in your favor when you're, if you're working back into North America, right? Yeah, of course. Uh, I'm doing school in my mornings, but my morning is your night. Exactly. Yeah. So now... Where does, you got invited to go to Minerva University? Is that right? Yeah, I'm enrolled. I've been accepted and enrolled into Minerva. Yes. And that's 
tell us tell us about Minerva for people it's pretty exclusive Minerva is an interesting university it's the most innovative university in the world for a couple of years straight it's also the most selective university in the US it only accepts one percent of applicants uh, to find students out of 20,000 applicants roughly what, what so was it's a very point? small university in, in San Francisco did you say two students out of 20,000? Two high students out of 20,000. Right. Wow. And so... It's, it's a pretty small university. It's not... Uh, it's obviously not as big as Ivy's or Harvard, but it's... It has the student quality. And the, one of the most interesting things about it is that you get to travel a lot. You visit, of course, San Francisco, but you also uh, might go to Berlin, Tokyo, Seoul, across your tenure at Minerva. And how long are you there? Like, th is it a three-year, four-year? It's a four-year university, and each semester, so about four to five months each, we travel to a new location. We travel to Argentina, India, Taiwan, uh, Tokyo, Seoul, Germany, all of these countries, which is very exciting from a cultural perspective. You said something really interesting about how you look at education. You said you look at education for people to learn and grow, and you're not as concerned about getting a diploma or a certificate or a degree. When did you kind of develop that? way of thinking? I'll use diplomas and certificates as a way to like show that they know something and prove they know something for someone else, which is valuable as an employee sometimes uh, for some roles. I, instead, I'm an entrepreneur. I need to prove myself first and then to the world uh what i can do and what results i can bring which don't require diploma this only requires insight and intelligence and yes if you a diploma usually reflects that but it is not necessary you can have the education without the certificate you can learn something without giving a test on it the actual test is applying it into the real world, in real scenarios. Plus, again, I'm an entrepreneur. I am not employed by anyone, so I don't need anyone to tell me that I can be hired or not. Even when I hire, I never looked at diplomas. I just looked at what someone could do. Of course, I don't hire, like, I don't know, dentists or lawyers, stuff like that. Right. Not yet, at least. So these... Doctors. Like, I don't would, know. It would be important for yeah, a doctor. <laughs> it would be very important for a doctor to have a diploma. But for online-based roles, I've never found it uh, necessary. I care about the knowledge. I care about education. I just don't need to prove that education to someone else except yep. me and the world so i'm on side uh also being an entrepreneur i have never asked anyone or made it a requirement for a job for anybody to have a diploma certificate a ba a master's never since i have started like the only time that was important was when i was working for you know the in Fortune 500 companies, because that was their requirement. When I started my own business, I've never asked, because to me, life experience, experience, and how you approach a situation is far more important than the piece of paper, right? Tell me about what Ken AI is right now. Ken AI is software that 
takes your input as um you basically as a business you want leads and you want an ideal type of leads primarily you don't want just anyone on the market and we found this into like my marketing agency we didn't just want any educational brand we wanted like people who actually wanted to work with and but there was no way to efficiently do that so we created a software that scans all of that data from the internet that it can find about your ideal prospect. It learns about you as a business, about you uh, as a person and what types of clients you want to work with. And then it finds thousands and tens of thousands of leads depending on your market size uh, of leads that are actually a good fit for you. It qualifies them and it emails each of them a personalized email sequence that actually, again, sounds like you as you either a person or you a business because it's trained on your voice. So everything feels personal and it's everything feels like you. And to do this, we use a combination of both humans and AI to do that and a lot of technology. This achieves the best kind of results because it's not a robot writing this. It's both humans with the power of AI to achieve a, a very big scale. And it's, um, I think, well, it works clearly because it got our attention, but it's, so where do you see this growing? I mean, it's endless, right? With what you can do with with this i want to replace all shitty uh lead generation agencies over there everyone <laughs> has emails from oh i'll get you like 10 meetings this month of course uh no setup fee all performance only let me just try and then they send yeah again shitty emails but only damage your reputation but don't sound like you but are not personalized they are basically spam they and maybe have a pos ability to reach the impacts, but that doesn't mean they're not spam. They're still spam. Yeah. Because they aren't you. You just outsourced it. And then it damages your reputation. No one's going to buy from you once you damage your reputation. And then it creates more than it helps. Yes, you might get those. That means per month. Five of them won't show up. Three of them will be random people that are obviously not remotely interested and maybe they came out by mistake. So yeah. why the, yeah. Yeah, and it, it's key what you said that, you know, shitty leads because I get at least 10, maybe tw mm, probably between 10 and 20 emails, shitty emails in the morning, every single morning. And then they rotate because it'll be, you may have missed my first email, Leanne. So right. they're all the same. And it's also why at KNAI, so we use human copyright to drive this. No, like AI doesn't write our sequences, humans do. And each copywriter spends about three full days to write the copy for each one of our clients. Now, if they use the template, it would take like one or two hours. But because each thing is, unique and the follow-ups are not like hey my have missed my email it's not that it's we add more information to the initial email and what are different angles and approaches and this is why it takes so long but we that's why we get top one percent stats in every industry that we work in mm -hmm. and it's because of this care and attention that's put into everything it's because we use human uh, humans and ai what do you do for fun? <laughs> Does reading count? I don't know. I take a lot of walks in a park and I drink coffee for pleasure. <laughs> I see. Probably you work a lot. Probably you work a lot. I also like I work a lot. I, I like I like working, so it's not not all of my work is registered as work in my brain. Yeah. 
Now, I would, like, one of my first replies was coding when I, okay, coding is work, but it's actually not work for me most of the time. Right. And probably when you're not physically working, doing something, you're probably reading. Yeah, I'm, I work reading. Okay, most of the time I'm reading. So you have had say three three main major companies since you were 14 you're 18 now yes and to get those companies where they were you must have had a lot of i'll say inside of the success was some failures how do you how did you deal with those things that didn't work or it wasn't growing or this was a problem, that was a problem? Because you're kind of a fail till you succeed. Like that's when you get creative about other ways of doing things, right? Like, is that sort of the genesis of each company? Like you learned from each company you started to get to Ken AI? Yeah, Would you of course. Was out of failure outside those three companies in terms of, let's say, failed projects. Uh, it's not failure, but I'll just say it's failure for now, ways of understanding. I treat those as learning opportunities, of course. And there was a lot of failure inside each company. So my course, that was an initial failure of marketing for the first two good, two good years. A failure of managing a team than second company a quite and this also translates to the first company as well quite a colossal failure of management in terms of stuff would either get done way too quickly or way too slow like it, again it's a matter of managing the people correctly it's a matter of managing projects correctly um once I solved the like failure the marketing problem, we grew too fast and that meant the management problem came in to like knock on the door and here it is, like you grow too fast. That's then you are slow on basically everything else. But oh, like a lot of failures along the way. Those didn't exactly solve that one. It, it was just something that needed to be solved. So would you say then, so marketing in the first company, but then in the second company, at what point did you decide to incorporate AI? My second company, so marketing agency, we had a lot of success for our clients. Like right. we really could get a lot of students in. That meant we grew through word of mouth and referrals a lot. But this wasn't, no, like that's not a very sustainable lead flow eventually your clients finish like their connections and their connections finish their connections so it's not that sustainable now and then i let's start other sources paid ads for a b2b kind of company wouldn't work as well for an agency but it cost too much and we wouldn't get targeted ads anyway so let's do called outbound let's reach out to prospects in the dms in the emails so I hired five people, uh, a team of like virtual assistants uh, to do outreach for me. They would find leads, they would um, personalize emails, they would manually send those emails and DMs. And they reached out to like 1,000 people. And then in like two months, they got a client. But I was paying a five people team for two months to get yeah. one client. Yeah. Now, but the stats were good, they were nice. Um, they were way better than average, but still it was too much of an investment. So that's the evolve approach. That's basically spam people. <laughs> and of course I've got uh, like average industry kind of uh replies. Yeah. And statistics. And it still has worked. But then I was spamming people, so that that's definitely not good. Uh I did no one likes that, even me. Even if you make money, 
like drink something that you don't like better not to do it anyway exactly so, well and what that says is you have some some values yeah. right <laughs> you don't want to be spamming people as your business yeah i tried it for uh, right now i'm saying spam i didn't view it as spam at the moment but i now realize what i did right so in band what i did is let's just combine the two approaches how do i combine scale and like humanity that is into the same product uh without like hiring 20 people so that's when i thought of ai but it, this could maybe help i mean i tried developing I, i've coded something on the side it took me like a couple of weeks uh we found some results okay this looks promising let's develop this more by the end of 2023 i've began using the system for my whole agency and when we after we implemented it, we got so many replies and meetings and even like so many meetings that my sales team couldn't keep up. We later reached our client capacity. I I, I was also really stressed because we our shop rate was low just because we we couldn't attend all of the calls. So we we missed like one third of a calls just because we had so many calls booked. That's amazing, though. Yeah, it it, it has worked really well. We have like twenty percent reply rates at a volume of like twenty thousand leads per month, and at such volume, this is basically unheard of. Yeah. Like you can get twenty percent reply rates, of course, if you email like one hundred five hundred people. Not when you female like twenty thousand people, so of course that went well. Then I realized, why use this technology? No, no one does this. Why use this tech to uh, have such a limited opportunity? Where like in my marketing agency, we could only get four clients per month. Right, that was my limit. So why use this for four clients per, per month when I could help other businesses? Do the same. So yeah. right now, uh, Ken Group is uh, so my marketing agency is only serving current clients, uh, and still accepting referrals. But I don't use this to grow Ken Group. I use this to grow my Ken AI company. Yeah, and for our clients at Ken AI. Failing to succeed is is a little bit inaccurate. It's more you've taken what you've learned from each company, and moved it on to the next to make it better to figure out the market that you want to serve that is the bigger market, right? Where there are no limitations, where you can reach out to North America and Europe, say English speaking, which is a pretty huge market. And, and then the possibilities are pretty endless for what you can achieve. If you're able to generate. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's very smart. So time flies. I, I think you know, what struck me most about you was one of the things that you had said to me, which is there's really no limits to success. And I just want to have that conversation around your de definition of success. And it's the, the want to want conversation. The we actually care about success that was my question so do we actually want success oh, oh again what is success it's such a vague word that it doesn't really mean anything to anyone anymore everyone is it that uses it and at the same time no one really understands it even when you ask let's say successful people what the definition of success is we struggle to answer so that's let's just is reach wealthy if you care about material wealth uh maybe like reaching uh personal relationships so success is very, different for everyone yeah it's different it's different for everyone i guess most people would want 
a balanced life where they have the freedom to do basically whatever they want. They have uh, good relationships, good health. Like if you've got this free, I think you can be considered successful. Now, if you have a lot of achievements, this would be traditionally considered as successful. For me, I just want to grow I in any area of my life. If I'm growing, I am successful. And I would prefer to grow faster rather than slower. Uh, of course, I'm growing. If I'm growing faster, I'm more successful. So this is my personal definition of success. It's growing. And yeah, it's just growing with whatever means. It might be education in some way, uh, as learning it might be growing as a person, growing with other people together, with my personal relationships. It might be just being healthier. It's also growing, you know, physically. Yeah. Literally. <laughs> no, I mean, when you think about you've been on this earth for 18 years and you have a lot of wisdom. And to figure out that like you don't fit into a mold of any kind for any 18 year old, you have the wisdom to know that success is really a personal definition. Yeah. I think yesterday uh, I had a recent experience. So someone came on the street to me and they told me, hey, I, aren't you that guy on TikTok who does business anyway? So I just thought, yes, I am. Uh, how do I make all those boys per month? But it's, I struggled to answer because how do I give them that vision that all those boys per month is not what they actually want? And they might, they can reach for more if they really want to, but it's just that their vision limits them to, it, their vision limits, it, it limits them. If yeah. you only want all those boys per month, you are gonna maybe get all those boys per month, of course. Uh, you might actually not want more than offer goals per month or like whatever your goal is doesn't really matter in this case maybe that's your actual goal and you'll stop there and that's very good if you're conscious about it but my feeling is that they'll reach that point they'll not be happy they'll, they'll set the next target because then they don't make the conscious decision to put their goal right yeah yeah it's you know the older we get the more perhaps we focus on the wrong things because of needs. So we have to separate needs and wants. Do you know what I mean? So the older we get, we may need a certain amount of money to keep a, to keep a lifestyle and pay bills. And people confuse that for wanting. Yeah, it's more, I don't make any revenue goals because they make no sense to me. Like my goal is to grow. It doesn't, and that, but growth is technically unlimited. Yeah. So even 1 billion per month would sound weird to me because technically there is a higher point. Numbers go infinite. So I could reach for more. Yes, I have to have a wisdom to stop at a point, but growth is, again, growth is not only about money. So I could stop making more money, but I would continue growing enough aspects of my life. I just have to be growing. But then I don't need to make any monetary goal. Yeah. I think there's two things in life that are unlimited that we're given every day. One is growth. We can grow until we die. And the other unlimited thing is love. Both things are unlimited. So, you know, are we smart enough to take advantage of those things? I don't know. So we're going to have to wrap up, but I have a question that I always end with. And I don't know if this will mean anything to you or not, but I think it tells me about who you are a little bit. If you had your own late night talk show and you could have anybody in the world, dead or alive, as your first guest, 
who would it be? Why genuinely be Marcus Aurelius, the Roman Emperor? Mm -hmm. Why? Oh, I, I, I like Roman Empire, but Christian for books. It's and the, you said that on life, so I could choose anyone. No, yeah. Marcus was a man who had all the power in the world, basically controlled. I guess one of the three big empires at the time, together with China and the Hindu Empire, at almost its peak. Oh, many say uh, it's big as well. But then he was sane. <laughs> she was actually sane. And uh, he was like in his journal, he was conscious and present. He didn't really let his power consume him. He was wise. He was definitely very wise. So I would love talking to him of course sadly we only have his journals which might be even better what would be the first question so did the power get I to would... you or looking back what would you change <laughs> what would you ask him i would want to know how he detaches from his ego from uh like when you are Mark Sowers, everyone kisses your ass, basically. Yeah. <laughs> Put it lightly. Uh, how do you remain safe during all of that? It would be an interesting interview, for sure. But yeah, for you would enjoy that. at least we have the journals. Christian, it's been so great. I'm sure we'll be hearing a lot more from you very soon. Thank you for having me.